Uh, Worse yet, we have the same birthday. Same birthday. He was generous enough to hire me when I came. <laughs> and, uh, we are not related to each other. Uh, Alan is from Boston, and I'm from Providence. Um, but we have known each other for thousands of years now, and somewhere in the past time, we must have been related. Mm -hmm. I, I, I You're the historian. Um, yeah. Chris, I, I can't tell you how happy I am because at my school, I've been complaining for years uh, that history is horribly neglected. And um, Alan has converted to history, which I view as like converting to, I don't know, you name it. You know, <laughs> so I am so delighted to now say uh, that the uh, number of historians in the school has doubled. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how happy that makes me. I have three um, uh, questions, which uh, three questions, but also questions uh, to ask Alan. Uh, one, uh, this book is wonderful because it rewrites American history. And uh, it also rewrites, in some way, although Alan doesn't know about this directly, the idea of revolution. At the same time that we're talking about the uh, revolution, which ultimately does not result in the liberation of black um, in America, you have the French Revolution, which does not result in the liberation of women. And so the complexity of the idea of revolution seems to me is quite extraordinary. And I thought maybe you'd comment on that, but I have a few more thoughts, and so I'll load you up in the okay, chat. Maybe you better love these one at a time, because if you load me up with the for Japanese. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> the other thing is there's something in American history that really this book reminds me of, and that is, in the end, whites get together and put into place a constitution which is uh, anti-black. You know. And after the American Civil War, the same thing happens. Uh, white populations in the North and South make peace with each other, and they do it by instituting events about common suffering like Memorial Day, and nobody ever celebrates uh, Emancipation Proclamation Day. And these things, in effect, are very much a part of the rhythm of American history that in some ways continues to the present day, something I know you and I agree on. And so it's, it's, it's fascinating uh, because, above all, you've shown something about the relevance of these, uh, the American Revolutionary War to something that never seems to end in American life, in spite of our problem. And then a final thought, and you can comment on these anyway. I hope someday, for Alan's sake and for my sake, that they make a film not about Wilberforce, but about Mr. Peters. But I have a feeling I'll be dead before that happens. And so, uh, because what you do, even with things like the slave trade, the focus is always on uh, white Englishmen, et cetera, et cetera, and not on the kinds of people who are, who are identified and certainly deserve a place in American history beyond what Don Gibson did that awful movie that he made. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yes, there were no blacks who fought for South Carolina. The yeah, uh, militia patrolled to suppress blacks. Yeah. So, even in what is good in the film is completely wrong. It's ridiculous. Adam, if you could just comment on one or any of these, I'm just thinking of my mind is kind of running wild here on this subject. But particularly, it's a pattern of the history of the Although, by the way, a mainly white audience in Boston stoned the screen when Birth of a Nation was shown. And at that point, Woodrow Wilson, who was a stone racist, showed the movie at the White House. There was a little exchange between Chief Justice Byrne, who was a Klansman. I guess he was, must have been a successor of the Dred Scott Justice and a predecessor of Mr. Roberts. <laughs> and he wrote, are you going to tell, does it tell the truth of that noble organization? And Wilson says, yes. And then Burns says, then I'll come. Right? So actually, my story is a story of how ordinary whites, up to and including the elite, Benjamin Franklin was a fierce opponent of slavery. And John Lawrence led a fight in the elite, which persuaded Washington, it was Washington's aide-de-camp along with Hamilton, to recruit black troops both in Rhode Island and at the zenith of liberation in the American Revolution was in 1779, the Continental Congress passed an act to free uh, 3,000 blacks in South Carolina and 2,000 blacks in Georgia in exchange for their fighting. And Lawrence was going to lead them into battle. 
and it was a very powerfully written resolution. It's called the Lawrence Hamilton Resolution because Hamilton supported it by historians. But actually, Hamilton, who was also, by the way, bisexual and had a lech after Lawrence, and so there was a correct, there's a very funny story about this, especially since the Republicans like to make out used to. When they were going after Clinton, they made out Hamilton to be something they admired. And actually, Hamilton is perfectly fine, excuse me, for sex out of this way. And, uh, but one does have to comment on the Republicans. Anyway, there was a big movement among whites to fight racism. Reconstruction was poor white as well as black. And when Muhammad Ali made a movie about Reconstruction, that's in that movie. The CIO, which has the black and white handshake, which has now been taken over by the AFL-CIO after it crushed the radicals in the CIO. The CIO, which was for the most part led by the Communist Party and other radicals who were very radical on this issue, fought against racism when there were black and white sharecroppers unions in the 30s in the South organized by the Communist Party. And far as I know, Andy Goodman wasn't black. And far as I know, I'm not black. And let's put it this way, I didn't go to Freedom Summer, but there are very few things where I've had the opportunity to go I haven't done since. And this book is an example. Yes? Thanks for the book, Alan. And uh, I'd just like to say happy May Day to everybody. <laughs> happy International Workers' Day. And you know, the thread that you're describing here, uh, I think ties in very well Going back to what you mentioned about Philadelphia, Mississippi, a lot of the younger people here might not remember that Ronald Reagan began his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi. And, and one of the reasons that that happened was to create a southern strategy to be able to dominate political life and use that continuing racism in the South to, to be reelected and then to give that uh, Republican Party the power in the South to continue winning elections. And we can see that up to today, right now, with that Southern strategy and how it's dominating the South and the Republican Party is controlling it. So I think you know that takes us back and brings us through a thread of history and so like you know, there's a lot of illumination there that comes from your book and your writing. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, just to think about it. Um, Mickey Schwerner and James Chain were close friends, and they had been in Mississippi for quite a while. James Chain was from Mississippi. Andy Goodman had been at the SNCC school and was in Mississippi one day. The three of them went to the church, which was fighting for voting rights, which had been burned out by the Klan, and they were stopped by the sheriff and taken to the jail and released to the mob at midnight sheriff leading the way and buried on the Klansman's property in a dam, dug up six weeks later. And the one person ever prosecuted was Edgar Ray Killens, the racist preacher, who was convicted in 2008. It's all happened in 1964, so you can see that he lived a long life as a racist before spending the end of it in going to jail. Um, Cheney and Schwerner were friends, and their families asked that they be buried next to each other. And in the segregation of the graveyards, the Mississippi authorities in Philadelphia, Mississippi, would not permit that. So if I say to you that Ronald Reagan was a stone racist, and they praise for Ronald Reagan except for making they talk with Gorbachev, which is a very good movie. He's pretty disgusting. He was once a radical in the Screen Actors Guild who became a think for the FBI and you know, got taken up by GE Television, Theater of the Air, and Elevator. But we have a lot of people in this country. I mean, Mitt Romney is an example. How many people in this room pay 13.9% in taxes? Anybody? How many people in this room make under $30,000 a year. If you want to compare your income statistically to Mitt Romney's, I did this in the class, you know, it's unclear whether his $250 million is income or wealth, but it's some, you know, 
100,000, but you pay roughly, if you make 17,000 a year, as one woman in my class at Metro does, um, one and a half times as much in taxes as Mitt Romney. It's going to take a lot of work by the commercial press, the corporate press. Um, 